using Minecraft for propaganda. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Grab your stein of coffee because we're going to talk about Minecraft. You know, that, that fantastic game that all the kids are playing. Now, if you're not familiar with it, it's a game where you pretty much can do anything. You're just thrown into a completely random generated world, can adventure anywhere, can mine, craft and build things. Rachel and I played it back in the beta, back in the day when we were still just dating, and it's, it was a fun game, you know, back when so it was tough and you didn't have all these easy little things now. Now, my children are obsessed with Minecraft at the moment. They've been watching YouTube uh, Minecrafters and enjoying it, and, and I, I, as an educational tool, I think it's quite useful. So they saved up some money over this school term and earned enough that we could buy Minecraft. So we've started playing it again. I've got the, the family server up and running, and we're all jumping in together. And playing Minecraft with a three-year-old is an experience. I can't just say that. They, they make a lot of mess when you want a nice ordered town to build. But what, what's interesting is how that it's, you know, people are using it for education and people are using it for propaganda. You know, I had one, one YouTuber I follow, he explained how Redstone was the first programming language that he learned. All the systems that he created in Minecraft really helped him for his computer science degree. And I thought that was fantastic. So it's, it's really useful in many ways. But I think we should have a look at this. You know, an article that Rachel sent me from KidSpot. Probably because we're all a bit Minecraft obsessed right now. Minecraft teaching kids how to prepare for climate change emergencies. Now, I remember being a child in the 80s. We heard all about the, you know, what was it? Acid rain. Acid rain was going to fall down from the sky and melt us all. All the dolphins were going to die. There's going to be pollution everywhere. And, uh, the, you know, the world was going to come, come to an end. We're going to run out of food. All of these things. I remember being afraid. I remember being afraid. Back in the 80s, as a child, I remember asking my mother to buy a particular brand of dishwashing liquid because it would save the dolphins. As a kid, that memory is seared into me. Perhaps that's why I'm such a skeptical, cynical bastard these days. Yesterday, my children, uh, they grabbed a book, we went to the library, or they went to the library, and I read the younger two a story. And I I couldn't finish. It was just some hippy-dippy rubbish about the oceans. And I'm explaining to my eldest, I'm going, just wait. Just wait. All this rubbish that you're hearing, that you're hearing in the school and the news, you know, all these disasters. You know, even a few years ago, all the ice caps are meant to be gone now. We're all meant to be starving now. There are meant to be all these disasters all over the world. And it's all bunk. It is all rubbish. And, you know, I guess that just comes with age and experience. So don't let it affect you, I tell my children. But let's start, before we go through this Minecraft propaganda piece from KidSpot, let's jump to the Competitive Enterprise Institute, a libertarian think tank, where they've got a blog post, 50 years of failed eco-apocalyptic predictions. Because remember, I studied architecture, guys, and we were greenwashed hard at university, really, really hard, to the point where everyone wanted to design an inner-city, bloody, multi-story farm, the stupidest idea you could imagine. Just the carbon, the embodied energy to build such a thing to farm a bit of wheat. It just, it, it makes, it boggles the mind, it really does. Anyway, so, modern doomsayers have been predicting climate and environmental disasters since the 60s, and they continue to do so today. None of the apocalyptic predictions with due dates as of today have come true. What follows is a collection of notable, wild predictions from notable people, government and science. More than merely spotlighting the failed predictions, this collection shows that the makers of failed apocalyptic predictions often are individuals holding respected positions in government and science. While such predictions have been and continue to be enthusiastically reported by media eager for sensational headlines, the failures are typically not revisited. Now, here's the thing, and I understand why the media is doing this. It's the same thing on YouTube, everyone. Drama, fear, uh, any, any negative news just gets so much more attention. I will do a positive video and no one will watch it. 
It'll, the views will be just much lower. But if you want some drama in there, you got to you know that's how that's how it works, guys. So it's no different. That, that's how humans are hardwired. So I thought we would have a look at fifty false disasters. So you can put all of these predictions that people are making about the end of the world, about climate destroying all of humanity, into a bit of perspective. It, it's nothing new. We're not that special. People have been predicting the end of the world for since the world began. Or since I'd imagine since humans were sentient. There'd be an or an ape there complaining, you know, watching the trees about to fall over when it'll be fine for another fifty years. Nevertheless, let's have a look at this. Because frankly, with regards to the climate, it's a slow moving issue, and I think technological progress of humanity will certainly resolve it. So already too late. A dire famine forecast by seventy five. So Los Angeles, it is already too late for the world to avoid a long period of famine, a Stanford University biologist said Thursday. Remember all those 70s movies? Uh, what is it? That, that one where they have the, the diamond in the hand. End, Enders, endless Run? Logan's Run. Logan's Run. Remember that one? Oh. Paul uh, El- Elric said, The time of famines is upon us, and we will be, <laughs> and it'll be at its worst and most disastrous by 75. He said the population of the United States is already too big and birth control may have to be accomplished by making it involuntary and by putting sterilizing agents into staple foods and drinking waters and that the Roman Catholic Church should be pressured into going along with routine measures of population control. So you can see just some of the hysteria, the hysteria that we saw from the 70s, guys, from the 70s. So this this is the when people are arguing that the, the population is going to decrease, it's naturally going to decrease. Just as human development increases, people are having less kids. Not everyone is as insane as I am, you know, with number six on the way. I'd recommend it. Having a, a large family is fantastic. All the BS about kids costing you a lot of money isn't true. But, you know, each to their own. I just hope people don't leave it too late and miss out entirely. So here we go. Everyone will disappear in a cloud of blue steam by 89. What? Foe of pollution sees lack of time. Anyway, here we go. Uh, The trouble with almost all environmental problems, said Paul R. Elric, the population biologist, is that by the time we have enough evidence to convince people, you're dead. You're (laughs) dead. Wow. I mean, there you go, everyone. This is just insane. Um, 1970. Okay. Oh, hey. We're in ice age, awesome guys. We're in an ice age. This is this is just fantastic. Hang on, I just need to check here. My steak is cooking. Okay, I've got to. I'm going to cut out here. Go eat my steak and then come back. Come back and finish recording this. As we're in an ice age, I'll come back after eating a steak. I'm back from my breakfast steak. 400 gram rump with salt and a bit of tallow dressing. Oh, it was fantastic. I, I would recommend that to anyone. The perfect diet for the 21st century ice age that we're all living in. You know, good old steak. I wonder if I could get mammoth these days. <laughs> or oh, venison. Venison's good. Recommend that. Oh, if you haven't tried it, guys. Anyway, back to this article now that we're you know, in apparently an ice age. Scientists predict a new ice age by the 21st century. Air pollution may obliterate the sun and cause a new ice age in the first third of the next century. Well, we're in it now. It's 2021. As we speak, no ice age. No ice age at all. Oh, well. The demands for cooling water will boil dry the entire flow over the rivers and streams of continental United States. I mean, look at just this this rubbish. Same doctor, 1970s. Outspoken ecologist. We'll, We'll see. Here we go. Um, you know, subject to water rationing by 74, food rationing by 1980. If only Americans are now the fattest people in the world. I think Australians, are we beating them? But I mean, that, that's one thing. We're in this, this uh, hysteria at the moment. And there's not one, there should be article after article highlighting the fact that obesity and being overweight increases your chance of hospitalization if you, if you catch the, pand- or the plague or the pandemic 40 times. No, 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 never, never mentioned, never discussed. Is it because it hurts people's feelings? Okay, talking from someone who is a middle-aged father who puts on weight, particularly when the wife gets pregnant. You know, I've put on 10 kilos that I have to work off again. That's life. 
Okay, being fat means that your body is really good at storing food for the winter times. It's a, it's a survival technique. It should be something we're proud of. The problem is we don't have winter times anymore. We just have abundance consistently, and the the food that we eat is so full of sugar and garbage that you know, our bodies don't know how to deal with it. So you know, being fat shouldn't be seen as something to be ashamed of. Honestly, I mean, we should shame people. Well, here's the thing. If you know how to solve a problem and you decide not to deal with it, should that be something you're ashamed of? But if you don't realize what a, you know how to solve a problem, we should feel sorry for the people. So many people don't realize that their diet is what's causing them to be overweight. You know, they're just following the guidelines, listening to the government, and they're paying the price. Anyway, so... 1972, a new ice age by 2070 from Brown University. There you go. To the President of the United States. The main conclusion of the meeting was that a global deterioration of climate by order of magnitude larger than any hereto experienced by civilized mankind is a very real possibility and indeed may be due very soon. Well, nope. No, we haven't seen it. There we go. With best regards, George K. Kukla from the Geological Observatory. See, it's just headlines. A new ice age coming fast in 74. Space satellites show new ice age coming fast. It happens. That uh, blocking, what is it? Uh, Anti-thelons, I don't know what that is, play an important role in the characteristic of weather in the Northern Hemisphere and account for some adverse changes to our own climate. Here's from the Times Archive, 1974. Another ice age, everyone. Great peril to life. Gas um, pairs away Earth's ozone. Oh, the ozone hole. Remember that? Ozone depletion. A great peril to life. That was what we, that was it from the child. It was all about the ozone hole, ozone depletion. And it's repaired. I guess this just, this just comes with age and experience. This is why young people who want to vote and influence the political system. They don't have, they, you know, by all accounts, they have just not existed as much as all the people, so perhaps they shouldn't have as much a say. Maybe maybe the right to vote shouldn't be younger. It shouldn't hit until you're 30. We should go like the Roman Empire. A man doesn't get a say, or a person doesn't get a say, until they're 30 years old. What do you think about that one, everyone? Anyway, there you go. There's the ozone, maximum ozone hole layer. Uh, what do we have here? The cooling in 1976. So writer Stephen uh, Schindler, a young climatologist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, reflecting the consensus of the climatology community. I mean, there you go. That was rem- the great cooling from the 70s. Acid rain kills life in lakes in 1980s. I remember that. Um, so about 10 years later, the U.S. government program formed to study acid rain concluded acid rain no environmental crisis 10 years later seventy eight no end in sight to 30 year cooling trend but according to NASA satellite data there is a slight warming trend since 79 oh well there you go I mean this this is it everyone you've got to you've got to take this with a grain of salt on your steak more droughts likely, experts tell Senator, and we can't see this. Uh, James Hansen forecast increased regional droughts in the 90s. But the last real dry year in the Midwest was 88, and recent years have been record wet. I mean, this is the thing. You, you have People will link natural disasters to climate change for political purposes. The bushfires here in Australia. Remember, all these idiots, particularly the Greenies, who are the ones... You know, or I'd say their voters are the ones out there protesting, backburning for safety reasons, are then just claiming, oh, oh, these, these fires are caused by climate change when their protesters are mitigating the, imp- the tools used to mitigate the risk of these fires. I mean, it's brilliant. And then they get funding and they get into politics and they get to, to spew their rubbish uh, with an air of, air of uh, representation. If anything, it just shows the decline in education and understanding or the fact that we're no different to people in the past. Going back to why we need to raise the voting age, guys, to 30. So, 88, Washington, D.C. 
over 90 degrees Fahrenheit from 35 to 85 in 1988. So prepare for long, hot summers. If you like last, uh, last summer's record temperatures, you're going to love the 1990s, says James Hansen, the NASA scientist who, during congressional hearings on the Midwest drought, linked greenhouse warming to the heat wave. Washington, D.C., for instance, would go from its current 35 days a year over 90 degrees to 85 days a year. I mean, the reason is they need to make these dramatic headlines to get exposure. To get exposure. So it's probably good for him. It's probably good for his in, his organization that he represents. And Well, there you go. There's his forecast date. Yeah, so he's wrong again. So threats to, threats to the island from the Canberra Times in 1988. The Maldives completely underwater in 30 years. So, uh, male Maldives. A gradual rise in average sea levels is threatening to completely cover this Indian Ocean island, a nation of 1,196 small islands within the next 30 years, according to authorities. But the end of the Maldives and its 200,000 people could come sooner if drinking water supplies dry up. Here we go. 1989, rising sea levels to obliterate nations by 2020. And we've seen this again and again. Even the ABC has reported on this. And... I, I did a video on it, looking at uh, you know my, a small nation near Australia. I think Tuvalu, or one of them. And the issue is that people are building houses in stupid places. Okay, and this is coming from an architect. You don't build your house on sand right next to the water, and then oh no, you know the sea levels are destroying my house. No, no, you abandon that. You build further up. Okay, in a safe area. That's what you do. A lot of this is just it's just. Well, amateur construction, primitive construction, that don't know what they're doing because they're living like, you know, tribes from hundreds of years ago. So, and there's no evidence that the, that the, the rising has made any difference or even if there is any significant rising. You've got to remember, water will expand and contract with regards to the temperature too. It's a, the earth is huge. 1989, New York City's West Side Highway underwater by 2019. Here we go. Jim Hansen, same one, scientist who in 88 predicted the greenhouse effect before Congress, went over to, uh, to the window with him and looked at the uh, Broadway in New York City and said, if what you're saying about the greenhouse effect is true, is anything going to look different down there in 20 years? The West Side Highway, which runs along the Hudson River, will be underwater. Well, yeah, no, it hasn't. You know, within 20 to 30 years. You still believe these things. Yes, he's, he still believes everything. I talked to him about a few months ago, and he said he wouldn't change anything that he said. Oh, I mean, come on. There you go. It shows you. When was this written? In 89. So, 95 to present to climate model forecast. Here you've got the average models, and here's the observation. Now, this is the thing. The average person probably has never worked with a model at all, like a simulation to try and predict something. I really became skeptical of a lot of this stuff when I was working uh, for the government and I could see we had to do all these energy assessments of buildings because buildings use a lot of energy. And, you know, we, we had these, these different softwares and programs that you'd use. You'd type in all the parameters. And, you know, I thought, okay, it's going to simulate, you, you know, you'll take a model, a 3D model of your building and, and orientate it correctly and then it'll simulate the effects of it because, honestly, you, you think you should be able to. But here's the thing, it's all very simplified modeling, not very accurate, and they can bodge it. They can bodge it. They can, you know, change a tiny little number here and here thing here and completely throw out the entire result. And this is the stuff that's costing thousands of dollars that people have to spend on for their house to get these stupid energy ratings. I mean, come on. And then then I learned once I learned about embodied energy. Then I got real skeptical about a lot of this stuff. Because when you see how much energy it takes to make a product. That's meant to be green. And then you've got to realize, well, wait a minute, that, that has to be offset by the lifespan of the product. And then you've got to also take account the, the you know, the dem demolition of it. One thing is, what was it? Uh, insulation that they're forcing people to put in houses. I, I completely agree with it. I understand why people want to do it. But there's a cost associated with it. Your house has to be sitting there for 50 years before you get the benefit of putting that product in. Whereas... You know, what if someone, go, I'm going, okay, 50 years, maybe we'll just put it in one room. We'll be selective where we put it. We'll put it in the room where grandparents are going to live or where we're going to air condition the office, not in the whole house. 
save a bit of money, be a bit smarter with it. But, you know, there you go. Anyway, children won't know what snow is. Another one in 2000. Snowfalls are now just the thing of the past. Snow will start to disappear from our lives. I remember when, in this is in March 2000. I remember when I was in Victoria and we lived in Coldstream as a kid. It started snowing in Coldstream, but this was back in the 80s. Oh, 2012. Oh, sorry, 22. Famine in 10 years' time from The Guardian. Now Pentagon tells Bush, climate change will destroy us. Britain will be like a, a, will be Siberian in less than 20 years. I mean, is this what people want? I think they, they fantasize about this post-apocalyptic world where they can rise up, you know, all their, their soy strength, their diversity, diversity strength. They can rise up. You know, the, the Antifa will be in charge. It'll be like Mad Max, everyone. Anyway, so this obviously didn't happen by 2020. 2020. NASA scientists, we're toast. Hansen echoing. Oh, he's still pr- prattling on. Prattling on in 2008. He's been proven wrong again and again and again. Let's, why are they still reporting him? Ten years ago, Al Gore predicted, 28, 2008, the North Pole ice cap will be gone. Inconveniently, it's still there. I remember that too. You know? Just 96 months to save the world, Prince Charles says. This is what we're hearing with all this great reset rubbish. We even, we've got politicians here in Australia repeating this type of rubbish. And here's the thing. Is it because they don't know history or because they're using it for political gains? I think the greatest threat is the bureaucrats, everyone. It's not the politicians. Because the politicians come and go, the bureaucrats with this thinking are there forever. You need to make it easier to fire them and clean that house with every administration. All the way down. But flooring the government's so big. Well, there's a solution for that too. We shrink the government. We kind of make it a bit smaller. Here's a novel idea. UK Prime Minister says 50 days to save the planet from catastrophe. I mean, do, do people believe this? Do they fall for this? I guess they do. It gets the clicks. Gordon Brown. We have fewer than 50 days to save our planet. 2009. Arctic, ice-free by 2014. Oh, then you get the northern, you'll get that northern route you want. You know, Arctic ice in two years. <laughs> Methane catastrophe. Oh, so what else do we have here? Arctic ice-free by 2016. French foreign minister, 500 days to avoid climate chaos for 2014. And the planet, but the planet's still standing 500 days after French foreign minister warned of catastrophe so those are some examples everyone from the competitive enterprise institute where they've just cataloged all of these false narratives and you've got to understand it's for exposure yeah hey i see it on my own channel i see it on my own channel if you do something with a positive spin as opposed to a a, a negative spin it gets different traction that's just how it is so we need to call out the, these articles and be critical of them. And, well, this comes back to my concern with Minecraft, how it's being used to spread propaganda. It's really being used to spread propaganda. So let's have a look at this Kid Spot article. So Minecraft teaches kids how to prepare for climate change emergencies. That's the newest thing. It's coming up more and more. We'll have climate change lockdowns, guys. People have become accustomed to it for the greater good. You know, but to, to save the people from those who aren't doing the right thing. Climate change lockdowns. I mean, you can't even get a bloody plastic, plastic cup anymore or you know, a plastic spoon. I remember I was having an argument on, on Facebook, which is never productive, with some greenie guy. And I think I remember him at a, a political event. This was a guy that he was a two-chera. Two-chera. I'll have a drink while you think what I mean by that comment. In hospitals, they've got special chairs for really overweight people, particularly down in Logan where they've got a lot of the the big islanders. They need to have special chairs and special beds. Now, what these chairs are, they're like reinforced steel to really hold the additional weight. It's becoming a big issue in hospitals when they need to do emergency surgery or when people have to give birth just with the, the body weight that they have. Now, the reason I call this guy a two-chair was he needed two chairs just to make sure it would hold the weight. 
that was the risk that they have there. And I know that's insensitive. So you can see why it may be a little bit hypocritical when that person would be arguing that we should sacrifice for the greater good or people should be forced to comply with the no plastic or no, what was it? It was about the bag, plastic bag ban, forced to comply for the greater good. And yet they're probably a net drain on the healthcare system that they so love. Anyway, that, we, we can't talk about that, Florian. That's, that's too mean, you know. Sure, it, it mitigates all the health risks that people have, and there's never any discussion about it in the media, but it hurts fee-fees. Maybe I'm getting too old, everyone. Maybe I'm getting too old. So, this is it's sponsorship with NRMA Insurance, by the way, because it was created in partnership with them. So just remember, this is where your, your money is going towards. For months in late 2019 and early 2020, our air was choking with smoke, our eyes burning, and flakes of ash fall from the sky. Yes, the bushfire. The experience has left a, a lasting impression on millions of Australian children who are inhabiting our earth, or sorry, inheriting our earth, with a very different climate to what their parents grew up in. Well, okay. Now, in some ways, that's right. It is a very different climate now that my children are, are inheriting than ours, a political climate. There's a much greater push for socialism. There is a victim mentality everywhere. You know, if you're being a victim now, it, it can lead to career opportunities. There are companies that are actively uh, discriminating based on race and sex. And they're proud of it and putting it all over their Twitter bios. That's the world they're inheriting. I don't know what other climate issues they're talking about. Doesn't feel any different. None of the records show it's any different. A lot of hysteria out there. There's the same bullshit that's always been talked about, but... Anyway, climate change is a reality, and they are already facing. Well, talking about the bushfires, when we went through all of that, I looked at a royal, uh, what is it, a royal commission 100 years ago, and the issues that was raised in that royal commission because of the big bushfires they had back then, well, same ones these days. Management mitigation strategies. People living too close to these areas, increased risk. So, and don't get me wrong, we are, humans are having, indeed having an impact on the earth, but it's not months away, it's not even years away, it's going to be centuries away. And by then, the technology and capabilities that we have are going to far surpass any of the primitive rubbish we do now. Here's a quote from our chief scientist, Finkel, asked, if the world were to reduce its carbon emissions by 1.3%, what impact would that make? on changing climate of the world, and his response was that the impact would be virtually nothing. The reason he's asked about the 1.3% is because that's our climate emissions here in Australia. What the lefties and greenies want you to feel guilt over and saying, you know, our carbon footprint is so huge is all the coal that we export overseas. The coal that's going to countries like India, where instead of burning dung and people dying from illness, they get to burn or use electricity. So they are healthier. Their human development index increases. Their quality of life increases. It's probably because they're afraid they're going to take my jobs. That's why. You've got to keep, keep them as dung burners. So this is horrific. The leftists don't understand what they're doing. On all, what's scarier is they do. Anyway. Anyway. Children need to learn what to do if they're in an emergency situation and have the knowledge to prepare before a natural disaster occurs. Well, Australians don't. The bushfires, all, no one had cash, so people were robbing convenience stores. That's what we've been taught here. Whether it's bushfire, flood or cyclones, whether you live in Australia, this generation is more likely to face some sort of climate-related emergency than those of past generations. But teaching children about these disasters comes with its own set of challenges. There needs to be a balance between educating them on the reality that they could one day face without frightening them. No, when you want to frighten them. That's the whole goal, is to indoctrinate them. Then you get these idiots marching, rich, spoiled kids, marching in the streets, gluing themselves with pipes to the roads, disrupting the cities, thinking they're making a difference. We've lost our way. It, this, I mean, is this the decline of Western civilization, everyone? You know, we just enjoy the ride down, eh? Oh, no, it's not. You know, you know, don't worry, it'll be good. That's why NMR, NRMA Insurance, and see, just woke, woke virtual signaling for a business, has 
A team forces with Minecraft to create climate warriors, a new Minecraft world set in a fictional Australian coastal town where kids can learn to deal with different emergency scenarios. Is this, this the town? Yeah, there we go. Oh, I mean, it's a looks like a nice model that they made there. Aimed at primary school aged children and rolled out through schools in the Minecraft Education Edition, also available to play at home via the Minecraft Marketplace for free. What about Java Edition? Can I run this at my own server? The game allows players to rescue wildlife, keep safe, and better prepare themselves and their homes for real life scenarios they might come they might face one day. Rescue wildlife. In Minecraft, it's meant to be a what's happened? It's a survival game. It, it's meant to teach you to become a prepper. It's prepper training. Teaching the kids to hoard, hoard animal skins and meat and prepare, build a farm, go go deep dig down to get your diamonds and your and your resources and build a base. And then you've got pillagers coming. It it really is like I mean, this is what happened to us the other day. <laughs> These pillagers coming to attack you. You gotta fend them off. It's about building a strong community and walls. Well, actually we <laughs> you know, Minecraft, maybe some other groups need to start looking at it as a way to educate children. What do you think? You know, more traditional living. Comedian and activist. Comedian and how I, 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 don't, I don't know who this person is. Craig uh, Ruskal, I don't know, has pushed Australians to act in the fight against climate change for many years and was at St. John the Baptist Primary School in Sydney for the launch of the game. Watching the students learn about the fight They'll have to take up. Oh, come on. Seriously, it'd be smarter to teach them how to program using Redstone. It was great to watch. They really got into it. It was really engaging way of teaching. I would just get spawned, you know. You know what you want to do is, for all the Minecraft nerds here, build a flying machine over it and just drop TNT everywhere to blow everything up. Oh, boy. Anyway, anyway. The kids were talking about the real-life fires. Those memories were really imprinted on them. They were talking about how koalas lost their lives. They're really aware it's important to give them more information and not hide this from them. The more information they have, the more they know about what to do, how to protect themselves better. Okay, I, 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 the information I will give my children is I will explain to them that the way to mitigate these issues is to reduce them, is that they have to do backburning. Backburning, which has happened for Tens of thousands of years, everyone. Come on. This isn't rocket science. This isn't new. We do the same shit over and over again every decade. He said, as well as teaching children how to look after themselves and their environment in a natural disaster, the game is inspiring kids to go home and speak with their families about climate change and what we can do about it. Kids are really proactive. I think when children get informed about stuff, they actually inform their parents and motivate their parents. Unfortunately, they're also going to be dealing with these big problems too, but putting them in a form they can enjoy. That's really, <laughs> they'll really engage with. Wow. More reason to take responsibility for the education of your children yourself so you can give them a balanced perspective, everyone. So they're not, because this will scare them. This will scare them. Children will get afraid. And they'll be like me, the little kid uh, convincing my mother to buy the dolphin dishwashing liquid to save the dolphins. Or afraid of the acid rain. NRMA Insurance, Executive General Manager of Safer Communities, uh, Ramana, Ramana James, said it was important to teach children about these scenarios early in life to give them a better chance if they face a real-life emergency. Climate change is having a significant impact on the frequency and severity of natural disasters like bushfires. Really? For insurance companies should know. Australia's ability to deal with these natural disasters it has is drastically increased through community preparedness, Mr. James said. Yes, and that doesn't help with political activists protesting backburning. Have we all forgotten that? Didn't everyone see the pictures of the people protesting? And then a month later, the community was gone. He said, mine, uh, he said choosing Minecraft... Oh, sorry. He said, choosing to team up with Minecraft, a game hugely popular in that age group, was key to reaching more children. Climate Warriors provides an immersive digital learning environment to help teach the next generation of Australians about the importance of being prepared through a format that they know and love. Through the play, uh, power of play, we want to ensure they're equipped for the future. Well, honestly, you should probably build a Minecraft 
to teach kids about the importance of uh, well, borders and walls and having protection and cities and why states limit or restrict people flooding in. Maybe that's an option. You know, you've got a town, you've got all this stuff, and then all just a horde of people floods in and eats everything, and then you will die. That'll teach them. Oh, Florian, you can't say that. Not on YouTube. Probably not. Unfortunately, in some rural areas, the kids are pretty traumatized by what happened in 2020. He added that while, of course, we would like to protect our children and hope they never face such a reality, our environment means we're better off teaching them to protect them rather than shield them from the possibilities. The kids will go, I know what to do in this scenario. I know how to prepare. Okay. So, I mean, there you go. Minecraft being used for propaganda. And what are the solutions to this? What are the solutions? Well, I think they're threefold. One is to be skeptical. Everyone, just, just be skeptical about all of these things. We've seen, teach your kids about history. Teach them that these end-of-the-world predictions get media attention, they get the clicks, they get the views. That's why they keep coming out there. Expose them to stoicism, everyone, <laughs> to, to try and get them to realize what they can control and not control in their lives. And finally, only noobs pay, play creative or adventure mode. You need to go hardcore or hard survival mode. Come on. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe to the channel. Let me know your thoughts and opinions on this one in the comments down below. If you're a fan and enjoy the content I create here, there are a few ways you can help the channel. You can join us on YouTube or Patreon. Support us by signing up for Self Wealth or Stake. Use our affiliate links at Amazon, eBay, Independent Reserve or Aussie Broadband. Buy a merch from Heiser Says, use Gold Pass from the Perth Mint, or support us via PayPal. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.